Good morning. Welcome to Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks for tuning in. We're going to continue now our reading and discussion of the book, The Papacy and the Civil Power, by R.W. Thompson. We've been talking about this papacy of Gregory the Seventh and how he extended the temporal power of the Pope and the many means by which he did it. And uh, we're still in discussion about Pope Gregory the Seventh, and we'll continue now on page 410 of the book, if you're following along, uh, beginning at the top of the page. If we look at the luster which rested upon the brow of the pagan Caesar, we're dazzled by its splendor. Yet if we pause to inquire how he won the diadem, we almost hear the groans of the multitude of victims who were crushed beneath his heel. So if we search accurately the history of this papal Caesar, speaking of Gregory the Seventh, we shall find him reaching his lofty eminence by trampling the most holy and sacred things under his feet, by giving way to the promptings of an unholy and unjust ambition, and by setting such an example as led to the corruption of subsequent popes and the demoralization of nearly the entire Roman Catholic clergy. The successors of Gregory the Seventh not only adopted his principles, but followed his example so far as they were permitted by surrounding circumstances to do so. Urban the Second, who reigned from 1088 to 1099, incited a crusade against the infidels in Palestine by holding out, quote unquote, the spoils, by holding out the spoils of victory as an inducement. In other words, he ordered uh, uh, a holy Roman crusade against the infidels in Palestine and simply said, uh, whatever you take in the process of these crusades, you can share. And so the looting was incredible, and the, the atrocities, as a matter of fact, this pope uh, uh, gave them plenary indulgence that whatever sins they committed in the result of these uh, crusades would be forgiven them and they so they ravaged the women and the children uh, it was diabolical and uh, and also needs to be pointed out the thing that most Christians don't understand today the most coveted object in the world by the papacy the most coveted object of the papacy in this world is Jerusalem, and particularly the very mountain upon which Christ gave his life. Mount Moriah in Jerusalem. Satan has a design to raise his throne above that of God, and to sit upon that mount, and to be like the Most High. And it is through and by the papacy that he hopes to achieve that false prophecy as found in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 12 through 15. So the Pope made his first attempt to capture the quote-unquote holy land, and Calixtus, that was Urban II, by the way, and Calixtus II, also one of the successors of this diabolical Pope Gregory VII, Calixtus II, who reigned from 1118 to 1124, gave to a monk the authority to subjugate the Church of England, to the court of Rome, and of reestablishing the Pope's authority in France. Pope Innocent II, who reigned from 1130 to 1143, hurled his anathemas at the head of Arnold of Brescia because he preached against the effeminate and corrupt lives of the priests and monks. See, all heavenly thunder rains down upon your head if you dare to mention the sexual depravity of the Roman Catholic priesthood. It says, Adrian IV, who reigned from 1154 to 1159, excommunicated the king of Sicily and granted the crown of, the crown of Ireland to the king of England. All these things were done in the name of religion by its 
perversion to uses never contemplated by Christ or the apostles. The character of St. Peter was wholly changed. Instead of being a minister of peace and love, sent forth without staff or script to preach the gospel, he was transformed, and I will add the words by the papacy, he was transformed into a temporal prince, ambitiously striving after the conquest and subjugation of the world. The Gratian Decretals, remember we were talking about the Pseudo-Isidorian Decretals, they've been added to. And uh, uh, this is an example of it. It said, the Gratian Decretals made their appearance about the middle of the 12th century. These were issued from Bologna, then renowned for having the best law school in Europe, now you know what the law schools are all about. They're all about studying Roman Catholic canon law. It says these, these Gratian decretals, also forgeries, were issued from Bologna, then renowned for having the best law schools in Europe, and were put forth under the sanction of the highest ecclesiastical authority. Okay, what's the highest ecclesiastical authority? The papacy, right? They too, like their predecessors were full of forgeries, all designed to promote the cause of papal absolutism. Okay, now you know what the law schools are all about. The study of Roman Catholic canon law and the fabrication of more forged and fallacious documents to increase the temporal power of the Pope in the world. That's what the law institutions are all about. Now, Janus, remember Janus was the author of the, the book entitled The Pope and the Council. Janus says of them, speaking of these Gratian uh, decretals, quote, In this work, the Isidorian forgeries were combined with those of the Gregorian writers, Deusdedit, Anselm, Gregory of Pavia, and with Gratian's own editions. His work displaced all the older collections of canon law and became the manual and repertory, uh, excuse me, the manual and repertory, not for canonists only, but for the scholastic theologians who, for the most part, derived all their knowledge of fathers and councils from it. Okay? So this is the, their, their sole source of knowledge, these false decretals. And it says, no book has ever come near it in the influence of the Roman Catholic Church, although there is scarcely another so choke full of gross errors, both intentional and unintentional. All these fabrications, the rich harvest of three centuries, Gratian inserted in good faith into his collection but he also added knowingly and deliberately a number of fresh corruptions, all in the spirit and interest of the papal system. Unquote. The brief enumeration of a few of the principles which, by these new forgeries of Gratian, became a part of the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church, will serve to illustrate still further the manner in which the papal system has grown. A system of religious persecution was elaborated. Okay, we're talking about the Inquisition. Okay, they justified the Inquisition through the Roman Catholic canon law, which has its derivation in false decretals, fabrications. And it says protection was given by the church to homicides and murders when the acts were done in behalf of the papal cause. So under Roman Catholic canon law, it's no sin for a Roman Catholic to murder and commit homicides uh, 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 if it benefits the papal cause of increasing his temporal power in the world. Okay, Those who kill a heretic or uh, uh, kill someone whose death benefits the papacy, it is no longer commit, uh, uh, considered a crime. Okay? It was made not only lawful, but a duty to, quote, constrain men to goodness and therefore to faith 
and to what was then reckoned matter of faith by all means of physical compulsion, and particularly to torture and execute heretics and confiscate their property, unquote. So you see how the Inquisition operated. It was designed to, to, to force physical compulsion and obedience to the faith of the Roman Catholic Church. And if they refused, they were treated as heretics, tortured and executed, and their, their property was confiscated to enrich the Roman Catholic Church. And now you see one of the sources of the great wealth of the Roman Catholic Church, which has uh, murdered the saints for no other reason than to acquire their property, much less to, to silence the truth. Now it was provided that whosoever shall kill an excommunicated person out of zeal to the church was by no means a murderer, because all who are declared bad by the Roman Catholic Church authorities are not only to be scourged, but executed. All who, quote, dare to disobey a papal command or speak against a papal decision or doctrine, unquote, were made heretics. Okay? So that makes me a heretic. And uh, I know what my end is going to be. But we'll continue. It says, The Pope was placed upon an equality with Christ. These decretals declared that as Christ submitted to the law on earth, though in truth he was its Lord, so the Pope is high above all the laws of the church and can dispose of them as he will, since they derive all their force from him alone. Unquote. Now, were you listening carefully? Do you see the rank in your face hypocrisy of this and the very proclamation that the Pope, the papacy, is the very antithesis of Christ. Now, it's all in here. So let's bring it back up, and as the cattle ranchers would tell you, let's ruminate on this. Let's throw this back up and chew on it some more so as to extract all the juice from it. All right? Now, here's what he said. Quote, As Christ submitted to the law on earth, though in truth he was its Lord, so the Pope is high above all laws of the church and can dispose of them as he will, since they derive all their force from him alone. Unquote. So that's a tenet in Roman Catholic canon law. First of all, that Christ kept the law. It was his law. He was Lord of the law. He wrote the law and gave it to Moses on the top of the mountain. And we all know as Bible-believing Christians, had Christ faltered in one area of the law, he'd have been guilty of all and never would have, his blood would have been worthless to us. No redemption. He would not have been the spotless lamb required for the sacrifice. And the papacy acknowledges that he kept the law. He was sinless, and his propitiation for our sins is effective. But on the contrary, his nemesis, his antithesis, his antichrist, his counterfeit, the one who deceives the whole world, it says the Pope is high above all laws of the church and can dispose of them as he will, since they derive all their force from him alone. So the Pope is not like Christ. He is the opposite of Christ. He can obey or not to obey his laws or any other laws as he sees fit. And all, the, all of his laws derive all their power and authority from the Pope alone. They are not God's law. You see, in this one quote, we have Antichrist. The open proclamation that the papacy is the very Antichrist prophesied to come in the Scripture. And this is what I find so difficult, in spite of the in-your-face proclamation by these, pap by these popes, that they fulfill the prophecy of Antichrist in the Bible. 
and that we not, need not look any further than the papacy for Antichrist. And the popes have been around since, well, nearly 2,000 years. And yet we still insist in the Christian world today that Antichrist won't come until the last seven years of time. And he's been with us all the time. Trampling God's people, shedding their blood, silencing the truth, corrupting the Bible, proclaiming himself to be the vicar and replacement of God on earth. He's fulfilled all the prophecies. It cannot be denied, but it is. Now, the book continues, If the reader has kept in mind the principles embodied in the false Isidorian decretals, as well as those of the Gregorian Code, and will add to them these equally flagrant forgeries of Gratian, he will be able to comprehend what was meant by the canon law of the Roman Catholic Church about the middle of the 12th century, and what is still meant by it today. It took more than a thousand years from the close of the apostolic era for these principles to grow and expand into the wonderful proportions they had then acquired. And even then the popes were indebted to the basest and most palpable forgeries for their existence. Pope Adrian IV became pope in the year 1154. When Frederick Barbarossa, the emperor of Germany, consented to be crowned by the Pope, he made a concession to the papal authority, which greatly flattered the pride and aroused the ambition of Pope Adrian. But besides his cession of Ireland to England, his pontificate was distinguished by nothing else so much as the conviction and execution of Arnold of Brescia by burning on account of his denunciation of the corruptions of the Roman priesthood. The forged decretals were just beginning to bear fresh fruits, most palatable to the papal taste, because it was considered necessary to to further and successful growth of the papacy that every voice like that of Arnold's, which cried out for reform, should be hushed and that every arm raised against papal usurpation should be stricken down. Alexander III was his immediate successor, equally ambitious and far more bold and daring. At the time of his election, an antipope was also elected, who took the name of Victor IV, the pontificate having become the object of most disgraceful struggles between rival aspirants. Frederick Barbarossa was at the time, at that time, prosecuting a war in Lombardy, and Alexander III commanded him not to press his conquest any further, lest he desire to incur the censures of the church. Frederick paid no attention to these threats, but summoned both Alexander and Victor to appear before a council at Pavia, where it was proposed to decide which of them was the rightful claimant to the papal tiara. Alexander treated the order of the emperor with as much disdain as his own had been had, had received, and both anathematized and excommunicated Frederick, declaring that, quote, the power of the popes is superior to that of princes, unquote. The council, however, assembled and decided in favor of Victor IV, who was crowned at Pavia, and recognized as Pope by the bishops and clergy of Germany and Lombardy. Alexander now excommunicated Frederick the second time and declared all his subjects freed from their oath of fidelity to him. This, like his former excommunication, was without effect upon the emperor, but it surrounded Alexander with embarrassments which would have crushed a less courageous man. With the emperor of Germany and the kings of Denmark, Sweden, Norway, and Lombardy recognizing Victor as the pope, and without any other support than the doubtful and hesitating alliance of the kings of France and England, Alexander III bore up against the pressure with wonderful ability. Though unable to reach the papal palace in Rome, he was nevertheless, quote, every inch a king, unquote, bold, firm, and defiant. Such persistent courage rarely fails in the accomplishment of its object, whether good or bad. 
At the death of Victor, which occurred in the year 1164 after the schism had lasted about five years, the whole aspect of affairs underwent a change. The exactions of Frederick in Lombardy had caused a formidable party to be formed against him there, and Alexander, taking advantage of the disaffection, was enabled by the use of money, there we go, money getting involved, to buy his way into the city of Rome. Seated now upon the chair of Peter and without, without a rival, he was able to turn his attention to the difficulties between the Holy See and the King of England growing out of the exertions of Becket, Archbishop of Canterbury, to bring that country into complete obedience to Rome. This he did so effectually that in a short time he had the satisfaction of seeing the English king completely humiliated before him, begging his pontifical protection, and disgracefully swearing that he would, quote, submit always to the Roman church, unquote, and requiring his sons to do the same. The contest between Alexander and Frederick was long and fierce. The emperor marched into Italy with his army, but was repulsed. At one time, a pestilence swept off his soldiers so rapidly before the walls of Rome that he was compelled to retreat, which strengthened Alexander on account of the popular belief that it was the work of a divine hand. At last, Frederick was driven to the necessity of submitting to terms of peace with the Pope, and when these had been agreed upon, he went to Venice to meet Alexander, from whom he hu humiliatingly begged absolution and forgiveness. The following account of this disgraceful scene is copied by Cormenin from the history of Fortunatus Almas. It says this, quote, when the emperor arrived in the presence of the pope, he laid aside his imperial mantle and knelt on both knees with his breast on the earth. Alexander advanced and placed his foot on his neck, while the cardinals thundered forth in loud tones, quote, Thou shalt tread upon the cockatrice and crush the lion and the dragon, unquote. Frederick exclaimed, Pontiff! This prediction was made of St. Peter and not of thee. And the Pope replied, Thou liest. It is written of the apostles and of me. And bearing all the weight of his body on the neck of the prince, he compelled him to silence. He then permitted him to rise and gave him his blessing, after which the whole assembly thundered forth the Te Deum. Unquote the Pope finally got to put his heel on the neck of, a, of one of his princes and established a precedent that continues even to this day. And if you can't see it in the world today, we simply need to clean our glasses and look at current events in the aspect of history. Then we'll understand. Inquisition update will be right back after these messages. Hear it first on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for missionary radio. 
These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Have you seen the Left Behind movies? Have you read the Left Behind fictional book series? Not everyone believes Left Behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. Because they see the world stage shaping to fulfill what they have been led to believe is sound biblical interpretation, a Left Behind rapture scenario this false view of prophecy is reinforced in the mind, not only of its adherents, but also includes those who have been merely exposed to the specific media. Is it possible that false prophecy can be fulfilled? The rapture theories have always been in dispute. Pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib disputes have risen up in exclusively evangelical circles of recent history so that when true believers don't suddenly disappear, this element will easily go by the wayside when all see a new Jewish temple begin to be built. Will this be part of the great delusion that will come upon the whole earth? It seems that this great prophetic delusion has already overcome practically the entire American evangelical and Christian world. Get the book. The rapture will be canceled. To learn more, visit CrossTheBorder.org. That's C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org. Okay, welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And by the way, if you'd like to comment or contact me in any way, my email address is tom at seawaves.us. That's tom at seawaves.us. And uh, I'd be happy to answer your email if it so requires an answer. And uh, also check out the webpage, inquisitionupdate.org. And um, hang on a second. All right, well, we'll continue now. Uh, we've been talking about the humiliation of the German prince, Frederick Barbarossa, the utterly humiliating example of this pope who put his boot heel on the neck of this prince and usurped over his head supreme and unquestioned authority. Now, you have to ask yourself, is this just an example of an era gone by? Did this die out with the civilized world? Did this die out with the modern era? Or does this still go on today? That's a very good question, a question that most people don't ask. And I maintain, after years of research into this subject, that one cannot understand politics in the world today, and particularly in the United States of America, unless one views those political happenings through the glasses of history. This example of Frederick Barbarossa continues today. And the kings of the earth have their necks under the boot heel of the papacy. 
And we're headed for the global conquest of the popes. And that civil law is only Roman Catholic canon law under another cover. Think about that for a while and what it bodes for the gospel and for Jesus Christ and his people. Now we'll continue. It says, The next day, Frederick Barbarossa, the degraded emperor of the great German nation, kissed the feet of Alexander and, on foot, led his horse by the bridle as he returned from the solemn mass to the pontifical palace. And thus Alexander III succeeded in accomplishing what many of his predecessors had striven for, actually placing his foot upon the neck of one of the greatest and proudest of earthly monarchs. The papacy had now risen to a height of grandeur and power which it had never reached before. The sword of Peter had conquered the sword of Caesar. This event gave so much joy to Rome that a picture of the Pope treading under his feet the head of the emperor hung for a long time upon the walls of St. Peter's Church at Rome and was afterward painted in the hall of the Vatican. Alexander, now seated upon a throne higher than that of princes, found that while he had been so vigorously engaged in the, pro in the prosecution of his ambitious projects, the internal affairs of the church had become greatly deranged in consequence of the prevailing corruption among the clergy. The necessity for reform had also given rise to numerous heresies, as everything was called that, that did not favor the court of Rome. He accordingly convened a general council at Rome in 1179 for the purpose, more particularly, of suppressing the Waldenses and the Albigenses. Now, if you were here and listening when we read the book, uh, The History of the Waldenses, by James A. Wiley, we understood that these were Bible-believing Christians who had fled Rome and had founded themselves in the, 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 the valleys of the impenetrable Alps, and they sought refuge in the mountains, in the valleys of those mountains. They believed that they were saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and that he alone was their king. And his one, one time blood sacrifice was sufficient for their redemption. And therefore, they threw off the authority of the papacy, and they saw the mass as an abomination. And they saw the depravity, the sexual and moral depravity of the Roman Catholic priesthood as abhorrent to the gospel. So they made their lives in the valleys, taking care of themselves, industrious people, farming those rich, fertile valleys, and as they could, they make copies of the scriptures with their own hands and carry them into the cities to evangelize those who were stuck under the boot heel of the Pope, to liberate them. Well, you might notice that the papacy saw them as a, a, a mortal enemy, because had the truth of the gospel been spread by these Albigensians and these Waldensians, Rome would have been destroyed from within. There would have been a Protestant Reformation. And in order to stave that off, the papacy declared a crusade against these God-fearing, Bible-believing people. Now, continuing with the book, it says, Among other decrees, this council enacted a, ca a canon which these humble and devout Christians are called abominable and execrable heretics. The faithful are admonished to take up arms. That is, the Roman Catholics are admonished to take up arms against them under the promise of indulgences. Yes, that's right. If you go kill the Waldenses and the Albigenses, we'll forgive you of all your sins. And we'll assure you a place at the right hand of St. Peter in heaven. That's what the papacy promises them. Carte blanche forgiveness for any sin that they might commit and give them free reign to take whatever uh, property that the Waldensians uh, 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 possessed. Carte blanche indulgences. They were admonished to take up arms against the Waldenses and Albigensians under the promise of indulgences 
are released from all their obligations to them, even though they may arise out of the treaty stipulations, are agreed for all their oaths to them, are, excuse me, are freed from all their oaths to them, however solemn, and are conjoined, quote, to confiscate their goods, reduce them to slavery, and put to death all who are unwilling to be converted. Not converted to Christ, but converted to Antichrist. Now thus we find the false decretals bearing still other fruit, the legitimate offspring and the execrable principle introduced by Gratian, which justifies a resort to force in order to compel the recognition of the Roman Catholic faith. You see how Rome evangelizes? Not by reason, not by the scriptures, not by prayer and fasting, but by force. And that force is applied at this time, particularly by the church, but through the civil power. Okay? That force is applied, that force of conversion to Roman Catholicism is applied through the civil power, through the governments of the world. Now, this is a principle still maintained in our own day, as we see in the syllabus of Pope Pius IX. He commanded all governments in the, in the encyclical and syllabus of error of 1864 by Pope Pius IX. He insisted that all the governments of the world obey him, and that any freedom given to the people, such as freedom of speech to criticize both the Pope and the King, were abject heresies to be rooted out. There goes your First Amendment, and that the only church worthy of state sanction is the true church, the Roman Catholic Church, and it should be the state religion of every nation. That's what's in the encyclical, and we're going to get to that encyclical and syllabus of error as we continue in the book. But Pope Pius IX was only carrying on the age-old tradition, aim, and goal of the papacy to make the world subservient to one single man, the biblical and historical Antichrist, the Pope of Rome. Now, Alexander, in obedience to the council, preached a crusade against the Vaudois and sent thousands of ignorant and rapacious fanatics among them to strip them of their property, to persecute and exterminate them. And by the way, the word Vaudois is simply in reference to these Albigensian and Waldensian Christians who lived in the valleys. They were called the valley people, and that is what Vaudois means, those who dwell in the valleys, Vaudois. Okay, so they led this crusade in the valleys, and if you were here to, to, to listen as James A. Wiley described how these people were hunted down like dogs, thrown off of the precipices in the Alps. One simply must wonder what kind of a diabolical mind could produce such carnage. And the betrayal of, of uh, uh, attempt after attempt of the Waldenses to make peace with these crusaders and how they were betrayed and killed and their goods confiscated to enrich the Roman Catholic Church. It was just diabolical. Now, R.W. Thompson continues, he says, All readers of history are familiar with the terrible scenes which ensued. Under a legate of the Pope, their peaceful valleys were invaded. Scaffolds were erected. The instruments of torture rent anew the victims of superstition. Then reappeared all the frightful apparatus which the ministers of tyranny could carry with them. Thousands of heretics, old men, women, and children, were hung, quartered, broken upon the wheel, and burned alive, and their property confiscated for the benefit of the king and of the Holy See. The 13th century opened with Innocent III and closed with Boniface VIII, in the pontifical chair, each of them ready to put into practice all the principles of the false decretals, especially those which attributed to the augmentation of the papal power. 
The sixteen popes who intervened between them so conducted the affairs of the church as to cause the historian Matthew Paris, uh, Matthew Paris, a monk of Saint, uh, a monk of Saint Albans, to declare that he had rather die than assist in the prevailing iniquities. According to him, they practiced an quote odious tyranny unquote, and their harpies snatched quote even the last rags which cover the faithful to maintain the luxury of the court of Rome, unquote. And so universal was the corruption that he explained, quote, religion is dead and the holy city has become an infamous prostitute. Notice the term he uses, it has become an, instant, uh, an infamous prostitute whose shamelessness surpasses that of Sodom and Gomorrah, unquote. That's from a Roman Catholic monk describing his own church, a prostitute, shamelessness, surpassing that of even Sodom and Gomorrah. Therefore, it was but the natural result of the condition of affairs at the beginning and the end of this century that both Innocent and Boniface should each endeavor to rival the most ambitious of their predecessors in extending and consolidating the power of the papacy. Innocent III, after repossessing himself of some Italian possessions which his predecessors had lost, turned his attention elsewhere so as to widen the fields of his conquests. He made an effort at negotiation with the Greek Christians that they might bring them again under the papal dominion. But failing in this, he incited the Bulgarians to revolt against the eastern emperor, caused a part of Servia to be detached from his empire, and made one of his own tools governor of that province. He quarreled with Philip, king of France, excommunicated him, and placed his kingdom under interdict, so that all the churches were closed for eight months, and the dead were left unburied. He purchased the grandson of, or excuse me, he pursued the grandson of Frederick Barbarossa, who was the legitimate heir to the throne of Germany with his implacable hatred, and endeavored to dispossess him by declaring first for Philip of Swabia and then for Otho of Saxony after the latter had made him large presents. He wrote to Otho, quote, By the authority which God has given us in the person of St. Peter, we declare you king, and we order the people to render you in this capacity homage and obedience. We, however shall expect you to subscribe to all our desires as a return for the empirical crown, unquote. You see the deals it's made between the papacy and the kings of the earth? We're going to crown you. And you can say that you were crowned by the apostle Peter himself, because we're his successors. But for that great dignity to be bestowed upon you, to be crowned by the apostle Peter, you have to render to us submission, unquestioning submission. Is this the deal that Christ made with his people? No. No. This is Antichrist. Now it says, but after, after this pontifical gift of the German crown to Otho, he was defeated by Philip when the Pope, with the adroit cunning of a politician, recognized Philip as emperor. Did you know that St. Peter is an Indian giver? That his word is not worth the paper it's written on? That's right. They reduced the Apostle Peter into a traitor, a simoniac, an adulterer, a pedophile, debauchee, what have they done to the name of the apostle from Jerusalem? What have they done with the name of the Savior of all the earth? Philip, however, was assassinated soon after, and thus being out of the way, the Pope turned again to Otho and consecrated him as emperor as St. Peter in Rome, 
taking care to require of him an oath that he would defend the Roman Catholic Church and its patrimony. Otho failed in this to the extent demanded by the Pope, was excommunicated, and all his subjects released from their allegiance to him. Innocent was satisfied with nothing less than complete and entire submission to his will. And true to the teachings of the false decretals, he inaugurated measures of force and oppression to compel obedience to the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. He issued a bull to his legate, Dominic, commanding him to put all the inhabitants of the city of Brezures in France to the sword. And in obedience to it, 60,000 Vaudois were burned beneath its ashes, none being saved but young girls and boys who were abandoned to the brutality of the soldiers. Imagine what that brutality was. Young boys and young girls. He resolved to crush out the rising spirit of popular liberty wherever it made its appearance and for this purpose canceled the concessions which the English barons had obtained from King John in the great charter of liberties and ordered that they be discarded under the penalty of excommunication. In all these acts and others of a kindred character he showed himself possessed of very high qualities as the leader of a party but all that he did was prompted by but one motive, that of raising the papacy above all the thrones and governments of earth. This, with him, was an all-absorbing and controlling passion. The canon law, founded as it then stood, mainly upon the pseudo-Isidorian, the Gregorian, and the Gratian forgeries, had already been constructed and construed with this end in view, and therefore... The personal interest, no less than the ambition of Innocent III, led him to preserve all these forgeries with care, so that in the course of time, a time that comes right down to our day, in the course of time, the quote-unquote pious fraud might become sanctified by time because perpetrated in the name of St. Peter. The result he hoped and sought for has been accomplished, says R. W. Thompson. Even back in 1876, at the time of the writing of this book, R. W. Thompson said they accomplished their goal. They had subjected all the kings of the earth to their submission. R. W. Thompson is literally predicting the new world order. It's simply the old world order restored. Now, when Boniface VIII became pope in the year 1294, one of the most diabolical popes of all time, when Boniface VIII became pope in the year 1294, the affairs of the church were in a very unsettled and disturbed condition. There were then, as there have been always, good and pious Christians among both the clergy and the laymen, with whom it was impossible to look unconcernedly upon the prevailing corruptions at Rome. Notwithstanding the Inquisition had been established by Pope Innocent III for the purpose of suppressing all inquiry into these corruptions, there were some of this class who had the courage to defy it and to cry out against the immoralities and the vices of the popes and those who basked in the sunshine of their favor. Not being numerous or powerful enough, however, to continue an effective body of reformers or constitute an effective body of reformers, their very weakness invited the continuance by Boniface VIII of the means inaugurated by Innocent III in order to stifle their investigations and put an end to their complaints. What did he institute? What did he do? The Inquisition burned them alive. He says the resort to force to do this, having now become a fixed principle of the canon law. That's right, the Inquisition, the burning of heretics. Anybody would question the morality or the judgments or the decisions of the Roman Catholic Pope and his priests and question the principles of the canon law that props them up in their phony positions and power are to be treated with force 
to acquiesce. Boniface, in continuing to employ it, not only had the example of his predecessors to justify him, but acted in accordance with his own inclinations. Caesonius said of him while he was a cardinal, quote, This cardinal had a great depth of iniquity, knavery, audacity, and cruelty, as well as a measureless ambition and an insatiable avarice, unquote. And many opportunities were offered him during his pontificate to exhibit all these characteristics. Boniface VIII made a cruel and unjust, uh, unjustifiable war upon the family of the Colonnas. There were two cardinals of this family, and these he drove out of Italy, despoiling, of their, despoiling them of their property and seizing their castles. He quarreled with Philip, the king of France, about this affair with the Earl of Flanders, one of his subjects, and threatened to interdict the kingdom unless he would recognize his temporal power over them. He commanded the clergy of France not to pay anything to the king for the support of the government without his consent. He declared in a bull issued for the purpose that, quote, God had established him over kings and kingdoms to pluck up, to destroy, to scatter, and to build, that the king of France ought not to think he has no superior and is not subject to the pope, that he who is of that opinion is a fool and an infidel, unquote. He addressed, him thus to, he addressed himself thus to Philip, quote, Boniface the bishop, a servant of the servants of God, to Philip, king of France, fear God and keep his commandments. We will you to know that you are subject to us, both in temporals and in spirituals. We declare them heretics who believe the contrary, unquote. These are the words of Antichrist. Let it sink to the marrow of your bones. Prophecies fulfilled. And we'll continue with our reading and discussion of the book The Papacy and the Civil Power by R. W. Thompson on the broadcast tomorrow. Thanks for listening. Visit crossthborder.org C R O S S crossthborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crosstheborder.org. I know you all want answers, and believe me, so do I, and I'll do my best to get them. Despite Nicolas Cage's promise to do his best to get left behind rapture answers for us, don't hold your breath. Not everyone believes left behind is true prophecy. Some may even regard as conspiratorial the mainstream re-release of the Left Behind movie with actor Nicolas Cage portraying the main character as an attempt to further reinforce in the minds of all this perception of false prophecy in order to condition the masses for the play about to begin. If you want true Bible prophecy answers, get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. The author exposes the Latin rapture origin the seven-year tribulation deception, true Bible revelation of Daniel's 70 weeks, the abomination of desolation, the restrainer, America in the revelation, the image of the beast and the mark of the beast, and the truth about God's chosen people, and so much more about Bible prophecy. This book will shatter the left behind paradigm of future events. Get the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. Visit crossthborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crossthborder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of the book, The Rapture Will Be Canceled. That's crossthborder.org.